Almost every generation has that moment in history that where you can remember where you were when a certain event happened. Some older generations may remember the first man that walked on the moon, or when JFK was assassinated as our president, or even before that, some of those events when Pearl Harbor was attacked. But for me, the day everything in my life stood still was the day America was attacked on September 11, 2001. I still remember where I was and what I was doing that day so many years later. This video is not to reflect on the terroristic events that happened that day and to reopen those flood of emotions that impacted almost every American, but this video is to pay tribute to just five people who were lost that day in the terrorist attacks. I wish I could profile and recognize and talk about every single person that was lost that day as every one of their stories means something. But today, I'm wanting to celebrate the lives of five men who share a common love that I do, and that is the love of baseball. On September 11, 2001, no current or former Major League Baseball players perished in the tragedies that took place that day. But were you aware that five former professional baseball players who played in the minor leagues were lost that day in their current profession's post-baseball playing career? Four of the five who were lost that day worked in the towers of the World Trade Center, but one was a firefighter who died answering the call of duty to save the lives of others. This video is being made because I want to remember those great men who were lost that share one common bond baseball. The video is being presented in a similar format that I have done in the past with my documentary type videos. The content I used to compile these profiles was based on old news stories shortly after the events of 9-11 and other internet resources. There is no intention on my part to give any untrue information nor omit certain details about these great men. Please enjoy this presentation. Martin Michael Borzewski, who went by Marty, grew up in New Jersey and attended high school at Morris Catholic High School. As a catcher, he had the opportunity to attend nearby St. Peter's College, now St. Peter's University, in New Jersey. On the baseball diamond, Marty excelled for St. Peter's and was a key member that helped lead the small college to a conference championship in 1994. In both his junior and senior year, he batted over 300 for the Peacocks. After graduating with his degree in finance management, Marty put the catching gear back on and played out the summer of 1994 playing in the Pioneer League, catching for the Lethbridge Mounties. His time in the Pioneer League caught the attention of the Pittsburgh Pirates who signed him to a minor league contract for 1995. Marty played the 1995 season for the Erie Sea Wolves, which at the time was an affiliate of the Pittsburgh Pirates. In 1996, Marty would sign with the Detroit Tigers and be assigned to their affiliate in Lakeland, Florida. After the 1996 baseball season, Marty's baseball career would end. Over the next few years, he would embark on his new career in financial trading. After losing Marty on September 11th, his family started a nonprofit called Friends of Marty, which helps give scholarships to students at his former high school to help with tuition costs. The nonprofit has yearly events, including golf outings and baseball events, to help raise money for his cause. The link to the Friends of Marty website is linked below in the video description. Mark Hendy, a Brooklyn native, attended high school after his sophomore year at Poly Prep Day School in Brooklyn. A talented athlete, Mark played basketball, football, and of course, baseball. After graduating high school, Mark decided to attend college at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. The tall lefty pitcher was going to Vanderbilt for first his education, but decided to try out as a walk-on with the baseball team. From 1992 to 1995, he was part of the Commodores baseball team compiling a career of pitching in 49 games for the team. In 1995, his senior year, he struck out 45 batters in 39.1 innings pitched, helping lead the team to the Southeast Conference Tournament. After graduation, he made a trek across the country, signing a contract with the then-independent league team, the Ogden Raptors. 
Mark only played one season in professional baseball for the Raptors, appearing in 24 games as both a starter and a relief pitcher. After that experience, Mark returned to Brooklyn and embarked on his career for a company in the World Trade Center. He started out as a clerk, eventually moving to higher positions within the company. Still having a love for baseball, Mark supported the Vanderbilt baseball program and actually donated money to have a personal seat license at the new stadium the Commodores were building. On April 27, 2002, the Commodores' new stadium had an opening ceremony where Mark's seat in Section E, Row 5, Seat 18 proudly displayed his name. In an emotional ceremony, Mark's father George presented the Vanderbilt baseball team with the Hindi family cross that was given to the family members of victims of the 9-11 tragedy constructed from World Trade Center ruins. To this day, the cross is displayed in the McGuigan Center lobby across the street from Hawkins Field. In addition, his name now also adorns an intersection in his old neighborhood in Brooklyn, the Mark D. Hindi 9-11 Memorial Way. Raphael Ralph Skorka was born in Nutley, New Jersey, where he played baseball for Nutley High School. Ralph's baseball dream came true as he signed with his hometown New York Nakies with his first professional contract. At just 18 years old, the young 6'3 Yankees pitcher split time in 1959 with the Yankees' Class D affiliates in Kearney, Nebraska and St. Petersburg, Florida. The following season, in 1960, Ralph would spend the majority of his year pitching for the Class C Yankees affiliate in Modesto. While in Modesto, Ralph would pitch in 39 games for the team, logging 135 innings pitched and striking out 115 batters, but also surrendering 129 hits and posting a 4 wins and 11 losses record that season. In 1961, he would get a shot in Greensboro, where he would post the best ERA of his career in the minors with a 3.65 earned run average in 30 games pitched. In 1962, Ralph would again return to Greensboro, where he posted a 3-2 win-loss record in 17 games, gaining him a promotion to the higher levels of the Yankees' farm teams Augusta and Amarillo to finish out the baseball season. After the 1962 season, Ralph's baseball dreams ended with no major league call-up and he returned to New Jersey to embark on his career in business. He worked for a couple companies such as AT&T and Liz Claiborne before embarking on his position with the company in the World Trade Center. On September 11, 2001, Ralph was a mere few years away from retirement from the business world when he was lost. Ralph's hometown of Nutley, New Jersey created a memorial along for him and the others that were lost on September 11th and is memorialized in the city to this day. Weinberg is unique on this baseball list in the fact that he did not work at the World Trade Center but was a firefighter with the New York Fire Department. I'm going to go a little more in depth with his story as I feel his story is truly heroic we will get to that in a few minutes, but first, let's talk about his career in baseball. Michael Thomas Weinberg grew up in Maspeth, New York, and attended a high school in Brooklyn, New York. A multi-talented athlete in various sports, Mike gained an opportunity to attend near to home St. John's University as a member of its baseball team from 1986 to 1989. In 1988, while helping lead the team to the Big East Conference Championship, he was named the tournament's most outstanding player after crushing two home runs, one a game winner against rival Villanova. After finishing his senior season, Mike signed a professional contract to play with the Detroit Tigers. He spent his first season in 1990 in short season rookie ball patrolling the outfield for the Niagara Falls Rapids. In 1991, Mike would be assigned to the Fayetteville Generals, where he would only appear in 45 games that season due to an injury. After the 1991 season, Mike could not overcome the injury and found himself leaving baseball, returning back to the New York City area. It is at this time that Mike embarked on his second love, focusing on becoming a firefighter for the New York Fire Department. He held a few odd jobs such as a lifeguard, a physical trainer, and even a part-time male model all while focusing on his career as a firefighter. 
1994, Mike joined the New York Fire Department, his assignment, Engine 1, Ladder 24. He volunteered at a local burn center and even posed for the fire department's calendar that raised money for the burn victim center. While at his job as a firefighter, Mike still brought his love to sports to work. He was a key member of the station's baseball team and often could be found at the station during downtime swinging a bat or swinging a golf club, which was his second sports love. Mike's family, friends, and co-workers said he had dreams of one day golfing professionally for the PGA once his firefighting days were over. This is what leads us to the story of his heroic journey to the World Trade Center on that fateful day. September 11th, 2001 was Mike Weinberg's day off, a vacation day. He had a tea time at a local golf club of just after 9 a.m. when he heard the news of the attack on the first tower. The instinctive firefighter in him immediately left the golf course as he had a sister who worked at the World Trade Center in Tower 2. One report indicates that Mike's car was found days later on the side of the road after the 9-11 events because it was thought he hitched a ride with another emergency response team to get to Engine 1. Upon arrival to the station, Mike was greeted by the station's chaplain, who lived nearby in a parish, and a fellow firefighter. The three of them jumped in the truck and screeched out of the firehouse, Mike at the wheel. Upon arrival at what would become Ground Zero, Mike, the other firefighter, and the chaplain came upon the grisly scene of the first building being damaged. It has been speculated that when the World Trade Center building gave way, Mike, the other firefighter, and the chaplain were all tending to the wounded when they themselves became victims. In 2013, a documentary was released remembering the life of Michael that was narrated by Alec Baldwin. I have found a few images and videos of events that had a screening of the movie that Michael's family members did attend, but could not find any links to the film as of me shooting this feature. If anyone has any information on where to watch the documentary, please comment below. The golf course where Michael left that day now has a plaque with his name in his honor and 72nd Street in Queens is now remembered as Firefighter Michael Weinberg Way. Standing in an imposing 6 foot 4 on the pitcher's mound, Brent James Woodall was a multi-sport athlete who excelled not just on the baseball diamond or the gridiron, but in the classroom as well. The Texas-born Woodall played high school baseball and football in California and would get a chance to first play football for the University of California rather than baseball. From 1988 to 1991, he played tight end primarily for the Golden Bears and would win back-to-back -back bowl games in his junior and senior season with the team. On the baseball diamond for Cal, the lefty pitcher would help his team reach the College World Series in Omaha in 1992. The Chicago Cubs would take a chance on Woodall and draft him in the 17th round of the 1992 draft. In 1993, he would be assigned to the Cubs' short-season rookie club in Geneva where he sparkled, posting a minuscule 1.30 earned run average and nearly 35 innings pitched. Going into the 1994 season, Brent was promoted to the next level, the Cubs' full-season A-ball affiliate in Peoria. Brent wasn't able to find his 1993 form while in Peoria after suffering a shoulder injury and after the strike-shortened 94 season ended, he was let go by the Cubs. At this point, Brent found himself at a crossroads and he moved to New York to put his college degree from California to work. He began working as an equities trader, eventually working his way to a vice president position within his company. At this time, he began a family, and on that fateful day, his wife was a mere weeks pregnant with their first child, a daughter. In light of the tragedy, his wife Tracy, also a former athlete who played volleyball at Columbia University, established the Brent Woodall Foundation for Exceptional Children. The foundation strives to give support to families of children with autism and development disabilities. A link to the foundation will be linked below in the description. The Woodall family additionally funds an academic scholarship to Brent's former high school in California in his honor. The award is given to a student athlete who best combines the academic excellence, athletic achievement, leadership, and outstanding citizenship exemplified by Brent. 
In 2011, Brent, along with former University of California rugby player Mark Bingham, who was on United Flight 93 on 9-11, were inducted in the California Golden Bears Hall of Fame. Another item of note, like her father and mother, Pierce Woodall, the daughter that I mentioned before, is currently an exceptional volleyball player for Columbia University, playing for the same team that her mother once captained. It has been an honor for me to present these five profiles to you today. Each one of the individuals I shared with you, their names can be found at the 9-11 Memorial, now located at what was Ground Zero in New York City. I ask for you to join me for a few moments of silence for these men and everyone else who was lost on that day. During the moments of silence, an image of their names and location on the 9-11 Memorial will be shown to you. As a baseball fan, if you ever find yourself in New York City, please feel free to find these five men's names and pay respects to them and the nearly 3,000 others who were lost that day.